All right, so this is InfoSec Decoded number 28, the EV tax. And we're starting with Alan telling us that the government is blind. The government was completely blind, but thanks to some newfound partisanship, uh, both parties are interested in now drafting legislation that will require companies to report to the US government whenever there is a cyber incident or breach, significant breach. And this is a major departure, even though it would seem like a common sense uh, uh, law that any company that suffers a serious breach should be reporting it to the US government, that has not been the case. Thus far, it's been up to companies to report voluntarily, and oftentimes they're not very interested in doing so. So now, supposedly, both parties are interested in doing this. This is a departure for the Republican Party in the past, uh, from the past in particular, because, of course, uh, unless uh, we're talking about uh, any kind of legislation that uh, you know, uh, affects the Second Amendment or uh, corporate uh, profits, uh, they don't want to touch any of that. But now it looks like something's going to happen. Details yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this is not passed yet. No, far from it. But at least there's some momentum behind it, finally. Now, I think there is now a national standard that you have to tell the customers if you lose their data. But um, telling the government that you lost data, that is certainly not required. In fact, it wouldn't be sure what government branch to tell. That's kind of the kind of regulation that Republicans would usually be against. But I think this Colonial Pipeline cyber attack has uh, inflamed everyone. Yeah. I remember I, I, I saw, I had a Secret Service agent come give a talk and she explained how the Secret Service mission changed after disasters. A president got killed, so it changed. All of our legislation seems to be knee-jerk response to disasters. Anyway. All right, and then I got, oh yeah, University of California is no longer gonna use the SAT or the ACT. Um, because during the pandemic, they had to quit using it because they never figured out how to let handicapped people take it. So it was not equitable in that regard. And there's been an outstanding lawsuit um, by people claiming that they're racially unfair and that ethnic groups have difficulty with the test and score lower. So they're getting rid of it. Um, and they haven't said what else they're going to do. I don't know how they're going to choose who to let in. But uh, it, it opens a big can of worms. I mean, one big thing is uh, what Scott Galloway is always going on about. Schools now brag about how few students they let in. We're a really good school because we only let in 3% of the applicants. And he's like, where are you supposed to go get an education? <laughs> and he said, you know, when I, when I got in this system like 40 years ago, it's like 60% or 70% of people got in. So what is this nonsense? What is a public school except to let everybody in? <laughs> so anyway, we'll see where this goes. But I know when I got in grad school, I got in entirely because of these standardized tests, because they normally hire only from famous undergrad schools. And I went to a little trivial undergrad school with no reputation. So they said, you had high grades, but we don't know what those mean. So we just based it on the standardized test. So if they get rid of the standardized test, there's another uh, you know, opportunity cost there. But anyway, it looks like the SAT and the ACT are going down for better or worse. Anyway, then we got Liz with uh, a patent trolls. Oh boy. Sure. Though I do want to say, I think it's good that they're going down for a variety of reasons. And I'd like to see that more um, be more widespread. I actually, when I was applying for transfer schools, one of the schools I applied to, Stanford actually, uh, required SAT tests that I'd taken, uh, I don't know, 23. 24 years ago. Well, that and doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense because that doesn't reflect who I am to, or what I know today. And it wasn't even on the same grading scale. And I mean, that's, there is a real equity problem with those exams. And I'm not sure, I, I really don't think that they accurately gauge either where a student is or uh, what their potential is. Really, it's did your parents have enough money to send you to a testing center so that you could get your score up? Did they have enough money for you to take it a whole bunch of times? You know, uh, so I, I'm glad to see that going down. But yes, patent trolls. Um, so this is actually kind of a cool story about patent trolls in that they're actually getting into some trouble in Washington state. This company called um, Landmark, 
uh, has been hitting small businesses with frivolous uh, patent lawsuits uh, based on um, basically uh, any small business that has a website they're hitting um, companies with these lawsuits saying that they're demanding license fees for web pages that contain privacy practices, shopping carts, products for sale, uh, and company home pages, uh, which is ridiculous because that's pretty much any, uh, <laughs> any business with a web presence is going to have that stuff, but that's how these patent trolls work. The way that they do this is they'll sue a company with the obvious frivolous lawsuit, but it, they know that it's going to cost the company more to hire a lawyer and defend it in court than it will be to pay whatever their nuisance settlement demand amount is, like you know maybe a couple thousand bucks, five, ten thousand bucks, um, and so the companies just pay them, and it's quite successful usually um, because it's just much more of a hassle and an expense to try and fight it than it is to pay it. So these small businesses just give up and sign, send over a check. Well, fortunately, uh, oh, I'm sorry, between 15 and $20,000 is, is been the going rate for this specific company. So uh, fortunately, um, the state of Washington uh, is actually is suing this company. They put their filed the lawsuit against them um, in uh, federal court and uh, hopefully they get some, <laughs> hopefully there's some uh, a good outcome from this case because um, this is just an example of, you'd think, well, this sounds so crazy. Um, this must be a one-off. It's not, unfortunately. This happens uh, frequently. Uh, EFF has um, some pretty good materials on patent trolling on their website. If you want to check that out, Electronic Frontier Foundation um, helps to tries to fight fight people like this whenever possible. But uh, it's definitely a, a little it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a thriving little industry to extort money out of small businesses. Yeah, I've been going on for a long time. And it was good if Washington State can do something about it. There is something called slap protection. Yeah. So ability to sue back, but apparently suing these guys back is very painful. It reminds me a lot of ransomware. Yep. Yep. You just have to price it at a level where the nuisance value is not too high. And right. then people will just pay it. Right. And, uh, you know, knowing that it's never going to go in front of a judge, right. um, it doesn't matter how specious these claims are. Um, the whole point is just getting paid. Well, I remember one of the first defenders was Microsoft. Microsoft held back Linux for 10 years this way while publicly denying it. They secretly yep. funded SCO, which had a very specious claim that they owned the Unix kernel and therefore all Linux was in violation. And Microsoft paid lawyers to just delay the case for 10 years so it would never reach a verdict. And they could say, you better not use Unix because there might be this huge legal problem. So you better yep. pay for Windows. Yep, and it worked. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, an old business technique. All right, then Irvin's got uh, iOS users get a choice. Uh, this is a ongoing uh, uh, trial of Apple versus Epic. Yeah. Uh, it's really centering around that walled garden that Apple has on their devices. Uh, the judge asked a very interesting question in it, uh, what's what's so bad about giving consumers the choice to Apple? Well, it's the same as voting. They might make the wrong choice. That's kind of what they said. Uh, their their thing was just well, uh, it would be undercutting sales at the App Store. Yep. So the issue is right that they Epic doesn't want to keep paying Apple's thirty percent fee, right? Correct. And they keep, they, you know, Epic makes some very popular game. What is it? Oh, I don't remember. Fortnite. Fortnite. Thank you. Well, I know nothing about it, but apparently it's very popular and they kicked them out of the Apple store, right? Yeah. My yeah. nephews love Fortnite. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the kids are just know. absolutely just in, in love with that game. And if it's not in the App Store, you're hosed, right? You can't get it. Correct. 
So this is, I think, the huge issue. And I think a lot of Democrats have been talking about this, like Elizabeth Warren and stuff. This is antitrust. I mean, Apple shouldn't have the ability to choke off a market completely. That's monopoly abuse. And they do. Yeah, so curious to see the result, the end result, but it's it's one of those things to follow. Oh, yeah. One of the, it's a huge deal. I mean, the uh, the app store is like one of the, it's like Windows used to be. It's one of those monopoly things that rakes in money and holds back the whole economy. And uh, if they can break it up or regulate it or something, they could aerate the financial system and make it work much better. Or they could, you know, do something clumsy and perhaps even make it worse. Right. Ah, and then we've got the awesome one: EVs getting charged. Getting charged? No, they get they they're 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 getting fees. Yeah. Of course, they're getting charged because oh, the other EV. kind of charge. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, puns aside, Clean uh, Technica has an article here um, talking about Tesla in Texas. So, what's going on in Texas? Uh, well, there's this Senate Bill 1728 that would essentially tax EVs heavily like if you want to get an ev like you're going to be punished for owning an ev which is mind-bogglingly backwards um since you know there's a lot of environmentalists and a lot of people that that want to move the industry forward for a lot of different reasons you know having these these tax decentives to be like no you shouldn't use an ev because it's going to cost you more from the government i mean it seems so backwards um, and it's not just, a, it's not like a hundred dollars a year. It's about, oh, it's going to be over $400 a year. If you own a Tesla in uh, Texas mm -hmm. and all these fees are going to, are under the guise <laughs> of, you know, of going towards replenishing taxes that they would have got from oil. Now, here's the thing about electric cars. Uh, I, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to let's let's be honest here. You're not going to be making the, the tax money you got from taxing oil. However, uh, there is a lot of health implications from using oil um, that turns into taxpayer costs, uh, such as health effects, for example, um, carbon, carbon dioxide and uh, fumes from gasoline cause a lot of health problems that the taxpayer ultimately has to pick up. Um, and of course, EVs don't necessarily have that problem unless you're living right next to a coal electric plant, but that's another story. And we'll get onto that later in the, in the podcast. Um, so, so there's already a lot of, of tax savings built into just owning an EV. Um, so as far as I can tell, the only reason that they're doing this is because, you know, there's pressure from industry, right. You know, to fight back against these EVs. And we've seen this in other countries too. Um, Sam, you, you of course shared a video before the podcast um, that unfortunately we can't share due to copyright reasons, but it's a it's a video on YouTube. All right, uh, I'm sure they'd let us play it. I just don't think the sound would come through. The the, well, the sound. Would... No, I'm pretty sure we get a copyright strike, even even in fair use. We'd only be able to play like five seconds of it, and you should watch well, the whole thing. But it's it's about right. electric. It's about the the government um, you know, honest sorry. government ad for electric vehicle, and in Australia, you know the government was you know, to say that EVs can't let you like do boating trips and they're not good for sports and all this stuff. And of course it's all lies for people that don't know. Um, EVs actually are more powerful than electric vehicles. If, you, if you're in a drag race on the street, you, you really want to unlock Tesla. <laughs> um, electric motors don't have the same limitations that, that uh, regular motors, uh, gasoline motors do. And they're a lot of fun to drive. Um, but of course the, the government because they were trying to, to appeal to a conservative base, were saying things like, no, these things are terrible. They're going to ruin your, your, your life. You know, you can't do anything fun in them. <laughs> you know, it's well, just I think they were terrible. And that's why Elon Musk made all this money. He made the first EVs that really rock. You know, I, don't, I, I, I think, I don't know if, if they were always that terrible. Though. The, the thing about EVs is, of course, that we didn't really have the lithium ion batteries up until very recently. Um, so if you want an EV in like the 80s, yeah, good luck with that. I mean, you just don't have the batteries. I mean, maybe you could use like lead acid batteries, but even still, those aren't really going to give the, it's just going to weigh too much. Um, uh, surely the, lithium, yeah. surely, the, surely the, the fact that this is happening in a uh, state that has the biggest oil and gas lobby in the nation, surely there, that can't have anything to do with this, right? Uh, no, of course not. Um, 
And, and actually, one of the things I want to point out um, is that the people sponsoring this bill, so who's pushing it? Um, there, there are three main people pushing it. Yeah. There's uh, someone named Charles Schwarzer, who's a Republican, R uh, Robert Nichols, who's a Republican, and Beverly Powell, who's a Democrat. Uh, so this is a bipartisan effort on the part of, of, oh. of Texas, uh, well, you know, to yeah. make this happen. So. Well, you one know, when I was a kid, they said an honest politician is one that stays bought. So, well, one of the backers for this, one of the main proponents of this bill is uh, a labor uh, leader of a, a labor group who thinks, and I've seen this happen time and again on uh, ill advised legislature. It's pushed by a labor group who thinks that um, this is uh, causing costing jobs building roads somehow and that uh if they uh implement this tax it will cause more roads to be built and more union jobs to be had which is uh even more backwards than the original uh proposed piece of legislation and i've seen this happen time and again it happens here in california all the time um it never works out like that. The, co the bids don't go to the union jobs because nobody wants to pay prevailing wage. Uh, it's all backroom deals where it goes to uh, whoever's construction company paid the most to the uh, elected officials campaign. That's, uh, I Besides, mean- Besides Teslas just, need roads too. That particular one makes no sense at all. Not yeah, only none, 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 yeah, not only do they need roads, they need new infrastructure. They do, so, they need charging stations. Yeah, they need charging, exactly, they need charging stations. And, and the charging stations are not simple. It's not just you plug it into a, you know, a, oh. a wall outlet. You actually need a good amount of current and voltage going in. There's a lot yeah. of infrastructure to be made and maintained using electric vehicles and a lot of union jobs to be had. <laughs> this is what I've heard is one of the big things about Tesla's is you get access to their proprietary charging stations that no one else can use. And they're the only companies big enough that there's actually enough of those stations. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that is one of the issues with specific to Tesla. Um, and, I, and I hope in the future we have more industry standards yeah. For, yeah. for charging vehicles. But You would think that the electricians unions would be pushing for this, considering, or pushing against this, considering uh, you need all you need specialized electricians to in, in, uh, install those public charging stations, but also power walls and power banks in people's homes to charge the vehicles as well. So, I mean, it's just uh, it's just ludicrous. I think that's one huge problem with electric vehicles is it takes time to charge them. You can't just fill it up like a gas tank. Even Teslas, I think. Um, as, far as, as far as I understand, it's not as long as you would think. Um, and there and there are newer technologies coming out, and we've discussed this on the podcast before. Um, things like uh, capacitors, uh, where you can discharge the capacitor really quickly, and then the capacitor slowly charges the batteries over time, and you can get sort of spot charges from time to time. Well, that would be good, but I've been hearing about that for thirty years. When is that really going to be practical? I mean, I hold on um, one second. I'll be right back. Yeah. They do have uh, they do have rapid chargers too that uh, you know that they put um, in in some of the like along interstates and stuff like that and um, I mean I think that charges pretty darn fast. Oh, uh -huh. looks like Caitlin's got something. Oh, I'm back. Yeah, and I have with me uh, mm -hmm. actually one of the modules here, uh, a supercapacitor module. Okay. Uh, you can charge this up in a few seconds and or not even within a second, given uh, uh, enough current. And, you know, this will, you know, start your car. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, it's definitely not a battery bank, but um, yeah, the, it has basically, you know, you can charge it up at like, you know, 20 amps of current. It's electrolytic? What? It's electrolytic, right? Yeah, these are electrolytic capacitors. Uh, they're very big. They're electro electrolytic supercapacitors. Um, so what makes these really interesting is that, they're really big and normally capacitors can store up to you know more than you know 220 volts whatever these only go up to 2.7 volts and that's why there's so many on here because of course they're in series so you can actually charge it up at a um, reasonable volt and of course um, 
they have circuitry below to make sure you don't um, accidentally, you know, blow it up. So, but no, these things will, you, you can charge this up in, in less than a second and then start welding for a while. I mean, it's, it's okay. here, it's ready to go. So those rapid chargers, you can, you can charge up to 80% in 40 minutes. So yeah, well, that's something. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm I mean, glad they have that circuitry because I blew up a whole bank of those in grad school. Yeah, no, if you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, with uh, yeah, with enough. Um, if you put a bunch of these in the car, I mean, you could really just charge it up within a few minutes and get get enough gas going to go like thirty minutes if you just need a little bit of a charge. Well, um, good. That's I think part of it is the improved technologies. A lot of why these electric vehicles are taken off. Anyway, so then we got Alan with no more captures. Boy, I wouldn't I wouldn't cry about that. Well, Cloudflare, source of many innovations, is suggesting an alternative to CAPTCHAs, and their solution is YubiKeys, or the FIDO Alliance compliant keys for two-factor authentication, but why not just use that for CAPTCHAs instead, or in place of CAPTCHAs instead, is what they're proposing. Sounds like a good idea on the surface, in principle. Now, rather than people spending what uh, Cloudflare estimates to be 32 seconds to complete one CAPTCHA, uh, one test being performed every 10 days by the average person uh, across 4.6 billion internet users worldwide. They say that amounts to about 500 human years wasted every single day just trying to figure out, is that in fact a traffic light or not a traffic light? But on the other hand, I don't know if uh, uh, FIDO keys are the solution either, because if anyone who's ever had one of those know, uh, knows, oftentimes you misplace your key and then you have to spend minutes or possibly hours looking for where you put that dang key. Unless and you put so, one of those uh, Google or Apple tags on it. Yeah, I suppose, yes. There, now we have the solution. Well, you know, the other thing I wonder is- but we'll see what comes of this. Couldn't a, an attacker just simulate one of those keys or indeed use one of those keys and bypass all the captures and put up bad things? I mean- Well, my understanding is no. So, you can't very easily clone one of those keys. Well, suppose I just use one and then, you know, make a thousand Gmail accounts. Are they going to keep track of how many accounts have been made per tag? So now they're tracking who you are again? Uh, well, that is a concern too, I should think, is that uh, now they're able to associate an identity yeah. with uh, the, the log or the, the passing the, the CAPTCHA test. So yes, this, this, this does seem a little problematic. I personally am just fine uh, doing the CAPTCHAs every so often. Yes, I'm losing a tiny fraction of that 500 human years every day, but you know, it's it's better than than dealing with the keys, which I'm a, a big fan of, by the way. I'm a big fan of the FIDO keys, just not not in this case. I remember this reminds me of uh, Steve Jobs in the early days of the Apple when I made like the first Mac. He told his engineering team to make it boot up faster, and he again calculated how many years of human life were wasted by making it take another five seconds to boot up. You know. So there are so many ways in which uh, we lose our lives every day. And uh, I mean, uh, it seems like CAPTCHAs are, while annoying, perhaps not the uh, biggest problem. I remember years ago, they said that if you s slowed down and drove 55, you would add a year to your life and you would also spend that entire year driving. Anyway. Anyway, so uh, then, then we're down. Oh yeah, here's the Apple AirTag, which I thought this was very fun. This is completely impractical. But it is interesting, technically, uh, a different hack of the AirTag. Last week, we had a guy who actually hacked the firmware and modified the firmware. But this guy reverse engineered how it works, which is actually pretty brilliant. You know, I wonder about the privacy of the AirTag. Here's what it does. It, trip, it encrypts everything. It sends an encrypted piece of data to any Apple device around you. So the tag is somewhere. That is then passed along from that device to a central server with a tag on it. So Apple's central server just has a list of like these hash values. And the hash value is encrypted with a key that only the user knows. So Apple doesn't even know which devices have set them up 
or where they were or which devices were found. It, everything is completely anonymous. So you have just this list of hash values and then you go log in with your uh, Apple ID, I think. And now it has the, now it can see if one of yours is up there and give it to you. And so what this guy said is they don't even know if that data is coming from air tags. I could just send arbitrary hash values up to their server and it will live on their server. And I can then query their server to see if they're there by simulating the Apple process. So you can use them like, like, um, like a paste bin. You can put data up on Apple's server and read the data back down Apple's server without being a real Apple AirTag. And so one way to look at it is you're getting free internet service. Another way is a way to hide things. You might be able to use it for command and control center. But it turns out you can only do it at an incredibly slow rate, like 20 bits per second or something. But anyway, still, it's, it's a pretty cute idea. You're reverse engineered at all. And just like Apple's been doing, they lock themselves out of everything. So even if they got a subpoena from the government saying, where was that air tag? They'd say, we have no way to find it. If the original user doesn't log into their Apple ID, we have no way to decrypt any of this stuff. And that does seem to be put them in a nice, good legal position. So anyway, I thought that's fun. You could look at it as free internet service or a free place to put stuff up. I remember someone did this with tiny URL. You could put whole files on tiny URL. <laughs> because you have this long URL, it lives on their server in a database and down comes a small one. So you can take like megabytes and compress it into these things and store it in their service. Anyway, and then Liz has got um, Colonial Pipeline. Yes, so this is kind of interesting because we had, we had this big attack, everyone freaked out, everyone panicked, there's still gas shortages in part of the country because of this. Well, it turns out that it was, and I think this is sort of an underreported story because I think it's kind of an important distinction to make. Um, the story, you know, the narrative around this has been that hackers shut down the pipeline. And that's really only true in an indirect way. Uh, the hackers didn't actually shut down the pipeline itself. The, the corporate executives did that because the hackers hit the billing system. And so they were afraid that they were going to be unable to um, charge their customers um, for uh, product that was delivered. And so they shut down the whole pipeline. Are you suggesting that there's something more important than money? Because that would be completely un-American. I, yeah, I know it would, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, the, the funny, not funny part about this is that it ought to be, you ought to be able to get, stand up a, a billing, um, stand up a billing system pretty darn quickly. They certainly didn't in this case. Um, and the, I think that the way that they reported it as well caused to uh, contributed significantly to the panic buying that that went down and, and caused people to do ridiculous and stupid things like fill up uh, garbage bags and shopping bags with gas and get into fights at the gas station and all kinds of craziness and, and pan, pandemonium. So interest, I thought it was pretty interesting the way that uh, that it was reported and the ensuing chaos. Yeah, well, you know, I, I have some sympathy for them. I mean, if you can't bill your customers, that's a serious business problem. That is a serious business problem. However, uh, it is one that uh, <laughs> it is one that you ought to be able to remedy pretty quickly. Um, with... yeah, you know, if it had been me, I would have thought, can we at least like pick our top ten customers and just call them on the phone and say, all right, uh, we're going to have to estimate what we're selling you this week, but we don't want to like stop the pipe. Yes, and 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 this is a really a prime uh, a prime example of what happens when you don't have a business continuity plan, yeah, uh, in place. So uh, you really you really need that, especially if you're a, a major corporation. And I would think you know I'd like to something I'd like to see down the line and in terms of policy is that, uh, you know, that there be some, some requirements for this. Uh, if you're providing a service that is this critical that people rely on, well, there need to be some standards. And one of those standards ought to be 
that you got that you've got a business continuity plan in place that you can enact. Um, not it, it, we're past the point of everybody can just fly by the seat of their pants and let the chips fall where they may if there's a cyber attack. Another thing I've seen this week, which I think is true, is they say uh, cyber insurance companies are probably going to stop covering ransomware because um, it, the cost of ransomware is turning out to be unpredictable and much larger than expected. And here I imagine they probably bought ransomware insurance and said, okay, that'll pay the ransom. So that's sorted. And they didn't think of these con later uh, issues caused by the ransomware where it turns out to cost, you know, 10 or 100 times as much as you thought it was going to cost. Yeah, And that's why everybody we, pays the ransom, because the ransom is peanuts compared to the damage to your company. Yes. But, you know, what's also peanuts compared to the, the damage that your company sustains is having a business continuity plan so you can maintain your operations um, when everything goes to hell. And two, having a disaster recovery plan so you can get things back to, uh, up to normal after the incident's over. Uh, and these are, I'm noticing more and more that these are, are two key points are neglected by a lot of companies, big, small, and in between. Well, to be fair, I imagine you have a disaster recovery plan for things like tornadoes, but they clearly don't have an appropriate one for ransomware. I think it's a new threat, and I think everybody has underestimated it, including the insurance companies. Yeah. So, it's the same old problem. Technology brings new problems and the establishments are not able to cope with them quickly. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it's certainly uh, rocking the boat for everybody. It's going to lead a huge uh, increase in cybersecurity hiring, which is good for us and our students. Right. And, and this is why you need to you need to hire good blue teamers. You need to you need to do threat modeling. You need to do tabletop exercises once or twice a year. You need to if you've got these plans in place, um, you need to go through them and make sure that they're still relevant. It's not a one and done deal. And also red teamers. I saw a guy on Twitter in the security industry saying you should hire like a red teamer to go on your network and say if you take over this one laptop, can you really get to everything that matters and trash it? and find that out and then fix that. Absolutely. And do it. And again, not a one and done. You got to do this as part of your maintenance uh, because things change. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I think like, like all these disasters, it'll promote our business. And Irvin wants to deliver rats filelessly. This is just another example of living off the land. Mm-hmm. MS Build can be used to send rats filelessly now. And what there is, is a nice explanation of how it was done, how to get that payload into MS Build and off it goes. I've never used MS Build. It's an alternative to Visual Studio. Uh, I've seen it around, but I haven't really interacted with it. Is it older or what's the point? Um, I don't know how old MS Build is. Yeah, no, it's been around for a while. Um, so like Visual Studio is sort of the front end, yeah. whereas like Microsoft Build is sort of the back end. So if you're using Visual Studio, are you using MS Build behind the scenes? Yeah, and the Microsoft C compiler and the Microsoft C Sharp compiler and all those things. And there's actually a ton of, tool, a ton of cool tools in the um, Microsoft SDK for Windows, uh, one of which I found uh, lets you create a reverse shell that's signed by Microsoft. <laughs> Ooh. So cool. Lots of fun stuff in the Microsoft SDK. What, so a reverse shell. Now wait a minute. What's that? Is that PS exec? What is that? No, no, it's it's uh it's it's just it's a program in the Microsoft Windows SDK. I think it's just called remote shell <laughs> or remote command or something. And you know, it's it's for remote debugging. Uh, but if you just run it and you you know set the right commands, you can use it to create a reverse shell to an attacker's computer that's all signed by Microsoft. Beautiful, beautiful. That, so that seems disturbing. I mean, <laughs> on several levels, like yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're, I mean, well, I mean, it's it's meant for, like I said, it's meant for debugging. It has its it, it's an, an important tool, but it um yeah, there's you know we we focus a lot on living off the land, um you know like what's built into Windows, but there's also a, a lot of cool tools that are built into the developer tools, that are of course you know owned and. Uh, signed by Microsoft, uh, which actually might be a very good um, DEF CON talk one day, I suppose. 
absolutely. I've seen some good living on the land talks and there's certainly more of those. Yeah, good. All right. And then Caitlin's got, to, oh, they're going to clean the debris out of space. That would be finally, fun. they've been talking about this forever. Yeah. Yeah. Yikes forever. Uh, there's a bunch of space junk in, in outer space and um, it's getting really bad. And of course, if we start having collisions in space, you know, that those collisions don't cause junk that falls down. It just causes more junk to cause more collisions. And if it ever becomes so bad, um, we kind of might trap ourselves on earth, which yeah. would not be a good thing, especially with uh, our infrastructure and, and internet being in, in space now, um, we really don't want to have that, that taken away from us, um, which, uh, yeah, there's a lot of issues about having our infrastructure in space and whether or not it is uh, resistant to a solar flare, a giant solar flare, but regardless, okay, regardless of having infrastructure in space, um, we have a problem with space junk. Okay, we got to get that stuff down. And the European Space Agency, according to space.com, uh, is planning to launch in 2025 a mission with a grappler arm. So it's like you know, one of those claw machines. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of ideas for, for how this would work, but they're going with the claw machine idea. And they're going to grab onto to a, an old rocket uh, as a first test run, you know, and just deorbit it, um, just like we saw with the, the Chinese rocket that <laughs> just landed somewhere. But this, this time it'll be more controlled and we're gonna start cleaning up space. And that's important. Space is part of our environment. It's not just the ground on earth. We have to think about the air and the space around earth too. As but our... this is a hundred million dollars to bring down one piece of junk. Yes, it is expensive. <laughs> but like I said, it has to be done. It has to be done. If, if it gets out of hand, all of our space programs, all of our space infrastructure is gone for good. Yeah, I like the fact, you know, if it breaks up, it stays up there. I saw a video of an astronaut that had come back from the space station and he's drinking his coffee and he just puts it in the air and lets go because he doesn't remember that things fall, which is kind yeah. of funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. And then, uh, all right, we're back to Alan with, oh yeah, the tiny injectable chip. Yes, it's time that we all apologize to the anti-vaxxer wingnuts. Yeah because it's true. There is now a technology that allows for chips to be injected into the human body using a syringe. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to a team of engineers at Columbia University, they have developed a chip that is about one-tenth of a cubic millimeter. And it uh, is so tiny that you can only really properly see it with a microscope and it can simply be injected into the human body. Um, and it will communicate, it can take measurements of certain, I don't know, bodily functions. And then you can communicate with it using ultrasound because it's so tiny um, uh, frequencies like uh, NFC and uh, you know, Wi Fi are just too high or oh. too low, rather. The wavelengths are, are too big, too long. So you have to communicate with it using ultrasound which I suppose wow. uh, offers uh, new fertile opportunities for the, the conspiracy theorists out there because of course, ultrasounds used for um, uh, imaging fees. So well, I was thinking of hackers. I mean, can you encrypt the ultrasound signal? Maybe I could carry around a device and like, <laughs> zap everybody. Yeah. yeah, well, I suppose this is a possibility we need to consider in the future too. So I, I, have, I have just one question. My question: um, How do you power these chips? I mean, how does it how does it get a current? I don't. I didn't see any mention of that in this very brief article. So I don't know. I know it, but anyway, the I, this is we're getting towards smart dust, which is a science fiction staple where these microscopic particles fly around and report on you, and you you therefore track everything everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the, the technology for um, implants, small implants, tiny implants is, is not new. That's been around for a few years, but we're getting smaller and smaller. And so, um, uh, you know, if uh, they can just sort out a few things like uh, the power supply, then uh, well, maybe this is, this is indeed something that we'll be seeing more of in the future. Oh, yeah, I think there's a bunch of uses for it, good and bad. 
Yeah, that's great. And then I got Chia tokens. So I'm I'm doing blockchain like crazy now, like I did a few years ago. And and so the new one, everyone's Elon Musk has uh, promoted people getting worried again about the energy consumption of Bitcoin. So they're trying to make alternatives. So the latest alternative is Chia coin that launched in March, which uses space on your hard drive instead of CPU cycles. So instead of burning up all the power in the world, powering Bitcoin miners, you'll pollute all the water in the world manufacturing hard drives apparently, and then disposing of them later or SSDs. So I'm not entirely sure about the long-term environmental consequences. And they said it is so popular, it has inflated the cost of SSDs, which I wonder if that's true because they make it sound great. And they say, you should totally do it. And you should do it on your Raspberry Pi and your home machine. And then they give you a calculator to show how much money you'll make. And the answer is if you give them a terabyte of space, then you can expect it to pay for itself in four years. And I'm like, who are you kidding? What the hell? I'm not jumping on this to get rich. I mean, that's terrible. You can pay a few hundred bucks now, plus a bunch of electricity and theoretically break even in four years. That's not the kind of return people expect from cryptocurrency. <laughs> so anyway, it's out there. I was gonna write a project and like analyze it, but as far as I can tell, it's not even worth paying any attention to yet. But uh, there is some interest in trying to make green cryptocurrency. The other thing people talk about is proof of stake. And proof of stake doesn't ever seem to work in practice, but proof of authority is what works. And a proof of authority blockchain is otherwise known as your bank. You have one central place <laughs> instead of having a bunch of miners everywhere that keeps track of it. And that works very well, but it has nothing to do with cryptocurrency anyway. Um, so that's the latest madness in cryptocurrency. And Liz has got uh, somebody, Apple sent my data to the FBI. Yeah, so uh, it's not 100% confirmed yet by her, but it looks pretty legit. Uh, the founder of SciHub, which for anybody who doesn't know, SciHub is sort of like the pirate bay of the academic publishing world. Um, their founder resides outside the U.S. and provides uh, unpaywalled access to um, a ton of, of academic and scientific publications that are usually really, really, really expensive to access because they're paywalled off by uh, Elsevier or whatever uh, publishing that's what, company. What, that's, pardon? What, that's what Aaron Schwartz did, right? The student at MIT. He took yeah. all this copyrighted stuff and made it available like on BitTorrent or something and ended up right. in a world of trouble. Right. And um, the woman who started the site has also been just constantly harassed. Uh, no, by basically she's committing a huge crime, right? Tons of copyright violations. Well, yeah, well, I guess, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's, it, it, to me, um, I've always been on the side of uh, people like um, her, her name's Ale Alexandra, and I'm going to butcher this, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, El Elba Elbuk Yen, uh, she and Aaron Swartz, I've always kind of been on their side because it's a, it's a scam. I think that academic publishing is a scam, so do a lot of people. Uh, typically what happens is, is this research is paid for by uh, public funds to begin with, most of it, uh, or university funded, and uh, the researchers never see a dime of this. Uh, the exorbitant fees that are charged by um, these publishing companies. Um, On the and, contrary, I've been the researcher. You have to pay thousands of dollars per page to publish. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, and I mean, it's a major racket. It's It's really not I think what they do is extremely unethical. Uh, I don't really know how it's legal, but it is. So, uh, and, and they definitely want to defend their uh, cash cow. Um, and so uh, at every opportunity, they harass this woman and put law enforcement agencies up to harassing this woman. And some of the, some of the, um, some of the some some are more far-fetched than others uh 
But um, I know that uh, a couple years ago, they were going after her and trying to say that she was somehow colluding with Russian intelligence. And that was, of course, found to be false. Uh, there have been a lot of accusations and a lot of investigations. And this is probably the most recent one where uh, she received a, a, a notice from Apple saying that the FBI had subpoenaed her info and they turned it over, so. Well, she's got to be, it's, it's like any, it's like the Pirate Bay, a very fair comparison. They got to have tons of legal threats and probably enough to eventually shut them down. I mean, copyright law is a real thing and they're real punishments. You can't just pretend it doesn't exist. Well, it is, except for the fact that this is hosted, uh, it's not hosted in the US. So I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure. One thing that we have a real problem with here uh, in, in this country is thinking that we can somehow enforce our laws globally and it doesn't really work like that. Are you suggesting there is some part of the earth that America does not own? <laughs> I know, it's crazy, right? How dare you? I know, I mean, you're definitely a communist. So, all right. And Irvin, oh, I've been told. <laughs> yeah, and Irvin has got sea glass. So this, uh, we were talking about this before we started. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a interesting experiment done by, who was it again? University of Washington, where they built a, basically a little, a little package, uh, various sensors from hotspots, phones, GPS, Raspberry Pi, stuck it in a box and had cars drive around to find uh, the, like the stingrays to go out and about in, in two cities, Seattle and Milwaukee, and plot if they saw anomalies. Now, it doesn't say how many they found. It doesn't say uh, any confirmed catches of a stingray. Uh, they just have nice graphic pictures of, for example, that uh, they found some cell towers near an immigration office that had more than two frequencies, which is what they usually find at cell towers. So they, they're you know, that stuck out or uh, just weird. It's really just one big search for anomalies. So nothing confirmed and no real number stated. They do have pictures of what they did. They have a technical paper. I think it costs like $500 to put together all the things that, that they used. Uh, but yeah, it's an anomaly search. Yeah, so I think this might be an important first step. I remember a few years ago at DEF CON, people had these Android apps that would supposedly tell you if there was a Stingray in use, and supposedly there were hundreds of them all over, but the method it was using to detect them was not very impressive, and I think they were probably false positives. But uh, it, you know, it'd be interesting if you could detect these surveillance devices. Obviously, they should, they would not like that, and they would just upgrade them to hide better. Right. Yeah, but, but it certainly is an interesting issue. And I'm, it's nice that they're developing the techniques. All right, and the last one is surprisingly good news. We usually don't have much good news, but apparently our, our power, our carbon emissions are less than thought. Yes, uh, well, actually we're going really good. So SciTech Daily has an article uh, claiming that US power sector is already halfway to zero emissions. Uh, now, of course, this is probably a bit misleading because I imagine getting to, it's more of a sort of a logarithmic, you know, decrease where you're going to get most of the decreases at the beginning and then it's going to slow down over time. But, but yeah, no, we are definitely decreasing our, our energy uses by a lot. Um, th there's a paragraph here that sort of explains the whole thing. So I'll read it verbatim. Uh, business as usual projections saw annual carbon dioxide emissions rising from 2,400 to 3,000 million metric tons from 2005 to 2020. However, um, the actual 2020 emissions fell to only 1,450 metric tons, which is still a lot, million metric tons, um, the, which is 52% below the projected levels. And so now they're saying, yeah, we're halfway to zero. Well, and I kind of question that, that logic. But, but it is a, a significant decrease of what, what, what we thought we would have if we just did business as usual. Um, and this has to do with two, two or three factors. One is renewable energy is just cheap. I mean, that's, and then also you have incentives on top of that, you know, just, you know, tax incentives and policies. Um, and also uh, we're living in a much more efficient uh, 
society than we thought we would be living in in 2005. So we were not using as much electricity as we thought we would. Um, and our policies are better and our electricity from renewable sources is cheaper. Um, so we're moving in the right direction, uh, which of course makes the original story of the taxing the EVs uh, much more baffling, but. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of the population crisis. So I grew up in the silent spring days when they said, you know, in a few decades, we're gonna overpopulate the earth and destroy it. And it turned out that's not what happened. It, it's, it's, have yeah. less children without anybody having to force them to. And uh, this looks good. I think market pressures, the fa fact that renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels, that seems like the real turning point to me. It is the, turn it is the big turning point. It's something we've brought up a lot in, in our podcast. Um, it, it reminds me of the old SETI days where we thought uh, if we were going to go look out in, into the stars, we're going to set up radio dishes and our alien uh, you know, compatriots are going to have such advanced technology that they're going to be broadcasting radio waves from stars, you know, light years away, and we're going to pick it up um, because, you know, we're ramping up our radio usage. Well, it turns out actually what happens is you just get more efficient and we're actually radiating less radio waves now than we were in the, you know, middle 20th century. So, so maybe there is somebody out there. Maybe, maybe there is, but we just sort of projected wrong. We sort of thought that energy would just increasingly get bigger and bigger and bigger and we'd have to build like Dyson spheres to you know maintain our radio communications but it turns out we just find ways to become more efficient so maybe they're just like hippies living on a green commune and they don't really like broadcast radio or want to come here and kill us or anything it is very unlikely any aliens would ever want to come here and kill us but if, if they are out there they're unlikely to be wasting all their energies you know using radio broadcasts that we can be that can be heard from light years away I just thought coming here and killing us would be so awesome that somebody would for sure do it. You but would think, but you know. That is what I thought, but maybe I'm wrong. That's what a lot of people thought. I remember, I think some famous scientist said, we really shouldn't be looking for ETs. We should be hiding. They're going to come kill us. You, you know, if they haven't done it yet, they're, they're probably not going to if they're out there. Well, yeah, that's why I like Fermi. Fermi said the fact that they haven't already come here and killed us means they don't exist because that would be inevitable. That made sense to me. <laughs> well, okay. Anyway, that's it. And we'll be back Friday.